So hello, welcome to today's day of physics. Uh, today we're going to start chapter seven, which is called rotational motion. Chapter seven and eight are kind of a pair of chapters that kind of go together a lot. That's about spinning things. So far, we've talked about things moving in a straight line. Now we're going to start talking about what happens when instead they're moving in a circle, like this instead of just nice straight lines. Basically, everything we've covered already in this class, we're going to do it again spinning. That's the short version. Um, as I said, spread between seven and eight. Um, only get to some of it in chapter seven itself. Here's the general idea. In linear motion, if you have a boat pulling someone who's water skiing, if the boat moves it, if and you got three people, guy in the front of the boat, woman at the back of the boat, person water skiing. Weird things that textbooks use for problems. Every, in a set time, everyone moves the same distance x. That when this goes across, yeah, everyone goes from the same place to another. We can say they all have the same acceleration. We can say they all have the same velocity. That x is all the same. But if instead you have people moving in a circle, like this series of figure skaters, that kind of breaks down. So I have here a little spinny thing. And it has on it two dots, a yellow one and a green one. If I start this heel and I rotate it to this point, well, what I can say, uh, sorry, my mouse disappeared. Nope, I need that back. Is that when I go from heel to there, the yellow one travels that distance. Meanwhile, though, when I go from heel to there, the green one travels that distance. That in this path, the two dots travel a different distance, which makes it kind of, if they're traveling a different distance though in the same time period, the time it takes to go from here to here is the same for both. So both of these would have different speeds or velocities. Both of these are doing different things. It's going to get complicated, except it seems like it shouldn't get complicated when they're attached to the same rotating platform, right? That it would be nice to may have one set of equations for both for one full rotating disk and not have to break them both entirely. Plus, if you're dealing with velocity as a vector, that direction of velocity is continuously changing as it spins around. And so that's going to get complicated also. And so what we're going to do is we're going to treat things moving in a circle, or talking about what angle they go through. Because when this goes from heel to heel, that's 90 degrees. The angle, if I go and make a line saying they start at this angle and go up to some new angle, I'm not actually going to go to fully to 90, I can say for both of them, they travel through the same angle in that time period, that this angle theta, that has a set value. And I can go and say, that's the thing that's continuous. P position or displacement's not, velocity's not between the two dots, but the angle they travel through is the same for the two dots. And this is going to allow us to define what is called angular position. Anytime something's moving in a circular path, we would define the angular position by just saying what angle they go through. Now, you're familiar with angles, I'm sure. Some, well, we've been doing angles a lot, something's at 20 degrees, angles and such. Um, I doubt you've ever really thought too much of where, where angles come from. And the idea is if something moves in a circular path, let's say it goes from right here, that blue dot, to right here, that new, I guess, gray dot, I don't know, light blue, gray, there's two dots. I should really make them more colorful. If they travel on that path, of a circle of radius r. We can define that distance along that path as the arc length. Well, arc length uses the symbol s. I'm never going to talk about arc length much more throughout this, but for now, just arc length is s. And what it is, is angle is defined as the arc length over the radius. How far the actual distance of this was, the actual traveling, and not saying straight line across. Right, going back to this guy. If I want to say the arc length and I go from heel to heel, I'm not going to go and just say 
straight line displacement. It's the actual distance it pa travels in that circular path. One full, so radi one full thing should be the circumference. By definition, the angle is the arc length divided by the radius in the units of radians. Radians is the official SI unit for angle. We've been using it degrees a lot. We'll come back to that. Of note, there's also like no, the standard to the right is positive, to the left is negative. We have a standard like that also in rotational physics. And the standard for rotational physics, oh, the spinning, is that anything moving counterclockwise like this is moving in the positive direction. Anything moving counterclockwise in the negative direction. So that thing spinning, that was all in the positive direction. Going back to this guy, this is moving in a positive angle. This is moving in a negative angle. The reason for that has to do with something called a cross product and something called the right hand rule. I'm going to talk about it a little bit next chapter. For now, just know that positive angle, negative angle. Now, keep in mind the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. And what it is, is you're used to doing angles in degrees, not radians. Radians is the scientific unit, once again, arc length over radius. But what it is, is people just kind of defined a circle to be 360 degrees. That one revolution going from here to there is one full revolution, where one revolution is going through the circumference, which is 2 pi r. That means one revolution, which is 360 degrees, is 2 pi over r or 2 pi radians. And this will tell you every revolution of a circle is 2 pi radians. And also that 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. You're going to get given a lot of numbers in revolutions in this chapter. And although, sorry, my mind just went songs talking about a revolution. Although we're going to do a lot of things in revolutions, revolutions is not the unit you want to work in. We need to work in radiance. And yes, we've been working in degrees for quite a while now. That's because degrees is the standard thing people measure it. But when doing angular kinematics, as I said, we're going to need to work in radiance. Now, radians is one of the weirdest units ever. They are a dimensionless unit. Think of it this way. I'm saying the U radians, an angle is S over R. S is arc length. It'll be measured in meters. And R is the radius. It'll be measured in meters. Meters divided by meters is nothing. But according to this chapter, what I'm doing here, meters divided by meters is radians. Radians is a kind of non-existent unit and that will appear and disappear at will. And if you try to do unit conversions, you'll sometimes just say like, there's no unit here and be like, oh no, it's radians, just make them show up. They have to be said, but they don't follow unit analysis. It's very annoying. Um, also, another thing, you're probably thinking, oh shit, we're doing radians, I gotta switch my calculator. Do not switch your calculator out of degrees. Your calculator needs to be in degrees or radians when you're doing sine, cosine, tangent of something. We won't be doing that this chapter. This chapter will not have any sine, cosine, or tangent. Though you can leave your calculator in degrees because you're going to need degrees for the stuff from all the other chapters. And other, instead of being like, oh, for this chapter, go this one. For this chapter, go that one, which we'll, we'll eventually do that, but that'll be later on. But for now, put your calculator, keep your calculator in degrees, even though we're working in radians. OK. So you will have to sometimes do unit conversions. Um, normally, when people give you angular velocities, which we haven't talked about yet, we'll get there, but I'm just giving the idea across. People will work in revolutions. If I tell you something moves at 8.3 revolutions per second, make sure you always convert to radians. You need to remember things like, you just need to know one revolution is two pi radians. Two pi radians is 360 degrees. I normally, I don't give that conversion. I expect you to know that one, that one revolution is two pi radians. And it's just treat like any other unit conversion. If I want 8.3 revolutions per second in radians per second, I just multiply by a ratio to cancel out revolutions and get radians. That's the general idea. 
Now, this fact that we can work by angle instead of displacement, it actually helps with a lot of things in how we work stuff. Um, interesting thing. If you look at the size of something, like you look at something in the distance, I, you can't tell, I'm looking out my window at my garage. I can see how tall my garage looks like it is, which looks pretty small, garage is far away. What it is, is actually a angle in your eyes, that your eyes, being spherical, when you look at stuff, you just look at a, a arc length. And when you look at something, what you're seeing is the arc length. In a solar eclipse, the moon takes up the same, the moon look, blocks the sun. The moon looks about the same size as the sun normally. The reason why is they take up the same angle of your vision, the same arc length. Actually, no, not the same arc length. I misspoke. They have very different arc lengths in your vision, but they take the same angle in your vision. Here's the general idea. The sun, and I'm working in American units because that's just what this figure had, so I apologize. The sun is a, has a diameter of about 864,000 miles and is about 93 million miles away. We can say that the diameter of the sun is an arc length of your vision. And we can say the angle it takes up will be its diameter, will be the arc length of the radius, or diameter of the radius. And the sun takes up about 0 0.00929 radians of your vision. The moon, the moon has a diameter of 2,160 miles, and it's about 240,000 miles away. And using this, we can say the moon takes up about 0 0.009 radians of your vision. The moon and the sun look about the same size because they take up the same angle of your vision. Well, 0 0.009 radians is about a half a degree. And so what we'll do is we can just define position like so. OK, any questions so far? Now, talking about something that's stationary is normally not very interesting, though. It's just like, oh, look, this thing is here. Yay. We're going to get into things moving like we did at the beginning. See, the first real chapter, not counting chapter one, just unit conversions. The first real chapter we did, chapter two, we talked about one-dimensional motion, things moving in a line. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about things moving in a circle. That instead of this, talk about this. And the general ideas are the same. See, we talked about displacement when we did linear physics. Now we're going to introduce angular displacement. And angular displacement is just going to be the final angle. Sorry, yeah, the final angle minus the initial angle, theta minus theta naught. That if this, I hate how my mouse disappears when I switch between things too fast. That if this goes from here, to there, we won't worry about the displacement. The linear displacement would just say, hey, that green dot went from here to there. That would be the linear displacement. But we'll say the angular displacement, what angle that went through. In this case, that was pi radians. One difference between angular displacement and linear displacement. If I move this from here to there, I would say the linear displacement is zero starting to stop at the same spot. That does not work in angular displacement. Angular displacement, you actually turn up the total angular distance it goes through. When I go from there to there, I say it's two pi radians. If I keep going, four pi radians. Keep going, six pi radians. Linear displacement, I say it's zero, starting to stop at the same spot. But if this makes one, two, three circles, I say it went through three revolutions, six pi radians. You add up the total amount of angles it goes through. Make sense? Now, theta zero is also going to be relative. Traditionally, this is where you define your zero point. But if something starts here and goes through, and I didn't count the revolutions and ends there, I could just make this up here my zero spot. Theta is not, is basically always going to be zero. Um, I can't think of many cases that we keep this term and it isn't zero. In fact, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Okay. Now, let's say this thing starts moving nice and quickly. And, you know, this guy slows down super fast. Let me switch to 
this again, the one I use in class. If I start the spinning, if I talk about the velocity, linear velocity, that's going to get complicated. But if this is spinning, I could talk about the angular velocity. See, at any given time period, it goes through a set angle. The blue dot and the black dot oh, are traveling different distances, so linear velocity is going to be complicated. Never mind the whole angle that, as it goes around, it's going to keep switching direction. But they're traveling through the same angle in the same time period. And what I can do, let me go back to this and so I can control it, is that as this spins, I'll just say, what is its angle? What angle does it pass? What is angular displacement? What's the time period? And we will define angular velocity as the angular displacement over time. Now, some things here. Angle and angular displacement must be in radians. Therefore, angular velocity will be in radians per second. Most commonly, though, people do not measure radians per second. Radian is hard to visualize. That if I spin this thing, it's hard for me to say exactly how many radians it went through. I would need like a special protractor. But if I spin it, I can go, I can count the revolutions. I can say, OK, one, oh, let me get spin faster. One, two, oh, that's too fast. <laughs> one, two, that was about two revolutions. One, two revolutions again. That's easy to count revolutions. You just watch it and you see how many times does it go in a circle. And how many revolutions in a second is kind of hard to tell. Seconds fast, one Mississippi is about a second. So one Mississippi, maybe like a half. How most people measure angular velocities is they time it for a minute. They set the thing going. Let me go back to this one because it goes longer. Is they set it spinning and start a stopwatch. And they say, OK, right here, I'm going to start my stopwatch. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, and count how many revolutions. And they count how many revolutions take place in a minute. For this reason, people most commonly give you angular velocities in RPMs. RPM stands for revolutions per minute. Of note, though, you do not want to work in RPMs. You have to work in radians per second. And so if you're given something in RPMs, convert it to radians per second. Also, this is average angular velocity. This is just saying if it's moving at a nice constant rate, like this guy was. For this one, it's not really a constant rate. It's slowing down and going slow and slow as it goes. This is just on average. We'll deal with instantaneous in a second. And the last thing I'm going to say, everything in centripetal, everything in rotational motion uses Greek letters. This is not a W. If you call it a W, I will correct you. If I, you keep calling it a W, I'll start picking on you for it. This is not a W. This is a lowercase omega. Everything will use Greek letters in this chapter. You might say that's not what an omega looks like because you might be thinking an omega looks like like this. That is an uppercase omega. A lowercase omega is kind of a curvy W. But yes, this is an omega. It is not a W. Good so far? Now, something to keep in mind is that when this thing spins, even if it's spinning, and I know I didn't put it on, but you can kind of see it on my camera on the side. Even if it's spinning at a nice constant rate, the linear velocity will be changing. Because as something spins, the linear velocity will be continuously changing direction. So the direction is changing, therefore the velocity is changing. Angular velocity will move at a nice constant. And that, oh yeah, so we'll go back to this. I was going to switch to the um, other one, but this will work. And so I can say this blue dot and this black dot have the exact same average angular velocities. They do not have the same linear velocity. The, the dot out travels further in the same amount of time. And so its linear velocity will not be the same between those two dots. That my yellow and green dot have different linear velocities of each other, different distances in the same time period. But the angular velocities will be the same. OK. So I know I can say I say translational speed. Um, translational will just mean linear. What translational means is the velocity of the point just pop, um, with the movement. What is the linear velocity at that moment? Any other questions? Now, in chapter two, we said velocity is displacement over time. Now we're saying angular velocity is angular displacement over time. 
also in chapter two, we said acceleration is change in velocity over time. And we're going to use the same logic here. Angular acceleration, which is something spinning up or slowing down, is change in angular velocity over time. And we'll have units of radians per second squared. And what we can say is if something is spinning in a circle, speeding up or slowing down in, see, I keep hitting the wrong ones. In this case, it slows down after I push on it. Then we can just say that it is, yeah, how much is angular velocity changed in the time period. Angular velocity uses the symbol alpha, lowercase alpha, Greek letter, and its units are radians per second squared. Also of note, keep to the standard, a positive angular velocity is anything moving counterclockwise. This is a positive angular velocity. Uh, when I'm just doing it constantly, I think this guy works better. This is a positive angular velocity. A negative angular velocity would be the opposite direction. Angular acceleration, if it's going, if it's going this way and speeding up, that'll be positive. If it's going this way and slowing down, that'll be negative. And like so, you just gotta keep track of what direction. But keep in mind, clockwise is negative, counterclockwise is positive. Questions? Let's do a mild example problem before I go where I want to go with this. The rotor of a helicopter turns at an angular speed of 320 revolutions per minute. The rotor has a radius of two meters. What arc length does the tip of the blade trace in 300 seconds? First things first, SI units. 320 revolutions per minute, I can't work in RPMs. If something is 320 revolutions per minute, I need to make sure it's in radians per second. And so I'll do a unit conversion. I'll multiply by a ratio. A ratio to cancel out revolutions. So I put revolutions at the bottom and get radians. Another ratio to cancel out minutes and get seconds. Here I put minutes on the top because it was on the bottom before. At this point, I just multiply through. 320 times 2 pi divided by 60, 33.5 radians per second, just like we've been doing unit conversions. Always make sure you convert um, RPMs to radians per second. Quick thing, um, 2 pi, 2, right, is 3.14. 2 pi is then 6.28, about. 6.28 over 60, it's kind of like a close to 6 over 60. It's about one-tenth. When you convert, your number should be approximately one tenth, a little bigger, 320 to 33, and so on. Always check that to make sure your number makes sense. Here's the thing if we know the angular speed, we can find the angular displacement. Because we said average angular speed is angular displacement over time. Now, this does not mention an angular acceleration, since it, it just says it's turning at this speed. And if it's turning at this speed, we can assume no angular acceleration. So omega average should just be omega. Now we, now sub naught notation, if you remember from chapter two, T sub naught means time at zero. T sub naught is zero. And as I said before, you can always make theta not zero. And so the angular velocity will just be the angle, the angle it goes through over time. I think it's showing by the little. I did ask for the arc length, but this is the only equation we had arc length so far. And so what I'll do is I'll say if I want, yeah, that showed up out of order. I have to fix that. If I want to find the angle it goes through, the angle will be angular velocity times time. Well, I take my angular velocity and multiply by time. If I want to know the arc length, once again, this is theta equals s over o is the only equation we've had so far for arc length. It depends on theta. I can say that equation just says that the arc length is theta times L. What angle went through, what is the radius? I can find the arc length. Any questions? Now, this is a pretty straightforward problem and you're used to my problems by now. This is way too simple for the type of thing I normally give you. No angular acceleration. Acceleration is the fun thing. When we did problems with acceleration, so far, kinematics, we had our kinematic equations. 
And we before had our acceleration, velocity, displacement. And now we have our angular acceleration, angular velocity, angular displacement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to derive a new set of equations. Well, before we had the kinematic equations, I am going to define the rotational kinematic equations. Kinematic equations where things are rotating. And I could derive these equations from scratch. But instead of that, I'm going to say, we already kind of saw the derivations. This equation looks identical to the velocity one, just now it's in Greek. These equations look identical to the linear ones, just now they're in Greek. And what I can say is when we did linear before, we assumed A was constant. If you were to do angular kinematics, we are going to assume angular acceleration is constant. And in linear kinematics, I told you, velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. The angular version of this, the rotational version of this, is just literally put it in Greek. Well, in linear, velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. For rotational, angular velocity is initial angular velocity plus angular acceleration times time. Where we once had x equals x naught plus v naught t plus 1 half at squared. We now have theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Where we once had v squared equals v naught squared plus two alpha, sorry, v squared equals v naught squared plus two a x minus x naught. Same thing, I'll just put it in Greek. We now have omega squared equals omega naught squared plus two alpha theta minus theta naught. It's the same equations, just with new symbols, because now they're rotational. And actually, they're simpler, because even though they're in Greek, it's just, you know, maybe like, ooh, Greek letters, those are different. It's just a symbol. It's actually going to be more simple, because for kinematics, we had to deal with two dimensions most of the time. Things could be going, you know, with the projectile motion, we could have some stuff going this way, some stuff going this way. And if, God forbid, we had something at an angle, you had to break the components. For rotational, for angular, all you have is, is it going counterclockwise or is it going clockwise? You never have to deal with two-dimensional stuff because there's only one thing. It goes one way or the other. It's not like if I want to suddenly go like it's spinning like this, like it's rolling, it's not like I can really work out an old thing. It just means you're just looking at it from the side. And so they'll actually be simpler than they will in one dimension, or in, than in linear. Questions? Oops. Okay, let's do an example problem. Um, so when I was a kid, I never understood the opening of the James Bond thing, the thing right here. Like what exactly we were looking down with the spiral. I always thought it was like a camera shuttle that was open or something. And it wasn't until I was much, much depressingly much older that I re learned that I was supposed to be looking down the barrel of a gun. The idea is a rifle. What a rifle is, is something with rifling. What it is is a spinning pattern, because what it does is makes a bullet spin. The reason you'd want a bullet to spin, we'll get into that next chapter, although I'm going to talk about it mostly with a football or a spiral, because I'm not a big fan of guns. But bullets fired from a rifled barrel spin gives greater stability in, a fight, in flight. Now, the M16 guns, what the army uses, 22 caliber M16. In that, when the bullet goes down a rifle, rifle's barrel, it rotates two and a half times in 1,074 microseconds. Knowing that, that the bullet rotates two and a half times in 1,074 microseconds, what is the average rotational acceleration and the angular velocity of the bullet when it leaves the barrel? So I only really know two things. I also know the length of the barrel, though that is not needed. I know the, how many revolutions it goes through. I know the time it does it. Now, I know I never want to work in revolutions. 2.5 revolutions, I got to convert that. One revolution is 2 pi radians. So 2.5 revolutions is 15.7 radians. 
and microseconds, I can convert that to seconds. Anything you're doing with rotational kinematics, you're going to want to jump straight to your rotational kinematics equations. Yes, theoretically, you could go back and try to do things with the omega average equals change in angle over time, but these are going to be your equations. These three equations are going to solve all of these problems. And just like in 1D motion, it's going to be playing the guessing game. I want to say, what do I know? What do I not know? I know the change in angle. I know that angle bit. I know the time period. Oh, I got ahead of myself. I know the time yet. I know the initial angular velocity. If a bullet's sitting in a gun, it's probably not spinning inside of it. It's just sitting there. It'll be starting at rest. So I can say the initial angular velocity is zero. And I know time. And just like before, I'm playing my matching game. I want alpha. Well, I don't know omega final. I don't know omega final, which is here and here. So those two equations are out the window. I got to use this guy. So I'll say theta equals theta naught plus one half alpha t squared. Or the change in theta equals one half alpha t squared. If I want to solve for alpha, I'll just solve this. I'll multiply both sides by 2, divide both sides by t squared. And when I plug in my values, I can solve. So it's a pretty big number. Questions there? The problem also asked, what is the final angular velocity? Now I'm going to use the same equations. There's always going to be the idea. So use the same equations. Solve for omega. Omega is average. Omega is final angular velocity. And I can see I can use this equation or I could use the bottom one. Doesn't matter which one. Use whichever one you want. They both work. I chose to use this guy because it's simple. I don't have to square things. You know, you start squaring things and taking square roots. That's just more complicated. Omega naught is still zero, so I'll cancel that out and just plug in and get a value. Side note, that seems really high. Just so you know, I did the conversion. That is 4,654 revolutions per second. Did that just so you'd see. It is stupidly high. That is the real math and the real numbers. Things spin fast. Okay. Questions? Okay. So all this has been with something just spinning, right? In a vacuum, basically. Just like, hey, spin it. And that's all we got. But this could also be used for things rolling. If something is rolling, like, I uh, here I'll just use my own. And something is rolling across. What's happening when something rolls? Is it's it's spinning, right? That as this rolls, the wheel spins. And as the wheel spins, it's having a linear motion also. There's actually a direct link between them. Um I don't know, you guys have probably seen these things before. What this is is a thing to measure distance that you kind of just like Let's see. Oh, yeah. I, if I go far enough back, I can measure the distance like across the room by just pushing this and rolling it across the floor. What happens as it rolls across the floor is there's a little piece here that every time that passes, it makes the little tickle. Oops. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I was holding it upside down. That every time it passes, it makes the little tickle. Who is it? Interesting, though, when I hold it like this, it's not actually going. Oh, there we go. It makes the little tickle go up one, 68, 69, 70, and so on. They can be zeroed. It's a way to measure distance. It's an easy way to measure distance because you just walk and you get a distance. How this works, what's going on, is because there's a direct relationship that when something rolls between the linear distance it travels 
and the amount of volts. And the general idea is that when something rotates, the arc length is radius times theta. We've already kind of covered that. Although I put it as theta, sorry. I said before that the angle is arc length over radius, just multiply both sides by radius, and you get arc length is radius times angle. Well, when something is rolling, the distance it travels is the same as the arc length. Because take a look, when I have my hand right here, I'm at the start part, right? Uh, yeah, start part right at the bottom. And you know what, let's make, for the people, for the people watching it on the video, it's, I have to control the size. And if I start going through, I can say that the exact arc length that travels, as long as it's not sliding, like if it's skipping and sliding, that's a different story. But the distance it travels is just the arc length it goes through. And if something is rolling without sliding, the distance it travels will be the arc length. And therefore, when something is rolling, the distance it travels will always be the angle it went through times O. This is how your car's odometer works. Your car knows how many miles it went, not because it's measuring a distance. It literally is counting how many times the tire spun. If you decide to like do crazy shit to your truck and give it real big tires and jack it up, your odometer is going to give wrong readings unless you account for it, which there's ways to fix that. Because if you make your tires a different radius than the car thinks it has, it's going to mess it up. Your car needs to know the radius of your tires. But this is how your car knows how far you travel. Now, back from chapter two, we know that average velocity is displacement over time. If I take that equation, if I look at this, I just said that displacement, if something is rolling, is equal to all theta. And that means velocity is all theta over t. But let's say something's rolling at a nice constant velocity. If something's rolling at a nice constant velocity, its radius probably isn't changing. And we also know that angular velocity is theta over t. And so by plugging these two equations I get, I get if so many times something is rolling or has wheels rolling, if not the whole thing, that the velocity is all omega. This is how your car's speedometer works. Your car speedometer works because it measures how quickly the angular velocity of your tires, how quickly they spin. And once it knows how quickly your tires spin, it can then go and figure out how fast your car is moving. Once again, assuming you're not sliding. If you're sliding, it can't figure out anything. But anytime you're rolling, it will know. You also do acceleration with the same logic. Tangential acceleration, and I'm going to come, I'll explain that tangential acceleration now. Tangential acceleration, so this is really should be tangential velocity too. That if something is rolling, I would say, I know this is spinning, but let's just pretend it's rolling because there's only so many things I can put in the camera. That the, the velocity of how fast the thing is moving across as it rolls, that's the equation on the bot, in the middle bottom right now. The acceleration of something rolling is going to be called tangential acceleration. This is the acceleration of a tangential point. It's the same idea if I said, what is the acceleration of a point right here at the edge? That's what tangential acceleration means. A point tangential on the edge. There's going to be multiple types of accelerations we have to deal with here. Mostly one called centripetal acceleration. I'm going to talk about it in a second. But of acceleration of a point at the edge, which would also be the acceleration of the car or motorcycle, depending if you're looking at the left side or the right side of the screen, that's going to be change in velocity over change in time. But velocity, we just said, was all omega. And so tangential acceleration will be all alpha. Anytime you need to switch between rotational and angular, it's all off by a factor of the radius. Any questions, though? OK, I got a question for you guys. Let's consider, this is a bicycle wheel. Um, I don't have a bicycle wheel easily accessible. I'm going to use this guy. Let's say I start this spinning. And let's just look at just the black dot for now. When this is spinning, and let's say it's not speeding up or slowing down, nice constant rate. 
If this is spinning at a nice constant rate, what is true about the linear velocity and the angular velocity? And so the questions are, um, hold on, polling. The question, the uh, options are, is A, or option one, both angular and linear velocity is constant. B, only the angular velocity is constant. C, only the linear velocity is constant. Or D, neither is constant. And once again, that is assuming no acceleration, or the weight isn't changing, I should say. The weight isn't changing, no angular acceleration. So I'll go, keep this open for a minute. I'm forcing the video to jump back so it doesn't resize the screen. Come on, the three of you left. So, 55 of you said option two, 45% said option A. And I mean, both, so basically everyone seems to agree that angular velocity would be constant, which is true. Angular velocity is constant. But we just said that linear velocity is angular velocity times radius. And so if linear velocity is constant, long, oh sorry, if angular velocity is constant, logically linear velocity should be constant. So you'd think they both have to be the same. On those equations I just introduced, I heavily glossed over something. And that's the fact velocity is a vector. Angular velocity is also a vector. But, Lin angular velocity is just clockwise or counterclockwise. See, if I have linear velocity with this thing spinning around, at all points, the linear velocity is in a different direction. Then I'll go back to this guy. That if this is spinning in a circle, right here, the velocity is this way. Here, the velocity is that way. Here, the velocity is that way. Here, the velocity is this way, and so on that as it spins, the velocity's direction is continuously changing. And that equation, that V equals omega R equation, is just for the magnitude. You see, only the angular velocity is constant because the linear velocity is changing direction and velocity is a vector. Direction is part of it. Now we know that acceleration is change in velocity. And therefore, since velocity is a vector, and let me go to spinning this guy, velocity is a vector that if this is spinning in a circle, even if I spin at a nice constant rate, the direction of the velocity is changing. If the direction of the velocity is changing, the velocity is changing. And if acceleration is changing in velocity, if this goes from here to here to here, there must be an acceleration. And this is the idea of centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration, which is A sub C, is the acceleration that keeps something on a circular path. Think about in Newton's, uh, Newton's second law, right? Or Newton's first law, really, but either one. An object in motion stays in motion. If left to its own devices, if I let go of this, it moves in a straight line. Then if I'm spinning this and let go, the second I let go, it stops spinning. It goes whatever direction it's going in. If I let go when it's going up, it goes, uh, sorry, just hit myself in the face. It goes up. If I let spinning when it's going to the left, it goes left. That's because there's a force keeping it on this path. There's a force, there's, it's the tension in the string. There's an acceleration keeping it on this path. That anytime something has its velocity changing direction, it must have acceleration even if its magnitude isn't changing. The magnitude of the velocity would be omega all. That's fine. But the velocity itself is changing because its direction is changing. Centripetal acceleration as a vector always points radially inward, points to the middle of the circle. 
and it's just going to talk about how the velocity changes. If you take an accelerometer and set it, oops, I didn't need to do that because I instead did it live. If you take an accelerometer and start it spinning, it'll read an acceleration. It'll say, hey, look, this is the acceleration of this thing spinning. And once this is up to full speed, which I think it is right now, it's spinning at a constant rate. But it says there's an acceleration pointing to the middle. It says that there's these stupid mouse. That these red dots are all lit up for my accelerometer. This being the same accelerometer we used in earlier chapters. That any time something spins in a circle, there must be an acceleration pointing in. And we can solve for exactly what that acceleration is. That when I spin this, I can say what acceleration is needed to keep it spinning. An centripetal acceleration is given as v squared over all. It is the linear velocity at that point squared over the radius. Because if something's moving in a circle, it might be easier to do rotational. And as we covered earlier, a few slides back, V equals omega all. So V squared over all is the same as all omega squared over all, which is all squared omega squared over all. So is... professor, I'm yep. confused why the main thing about this unit so far is that it's a circle. I'm confused why we would use linear velocity. Here's, okay. Let me do like two sentences more and I'll throw that in there. Okay. <laughs> There's two equations for centripetal acceleration. V squared over all or, or, or omega squared all or all omega squared. The order doesn't matter. You use whichever one makes sense for what you're given. Sometimes you will be given V. Sometimes you're given omega. If you're used, given omega, use the omega equation. If you're given V, use the V equation. The reason why, going back to your question, you might want to use the V equation is... Um, Let's say you're driving down the road and you're driving at 60 miles per hour and you make a hard left. If you make a hard left, you're moving in a circular path. When you move that circular path, you need it, you have a certain amount of centripetal acceleration to keep you on that path. It's basically the equivalent of, let me grab a, one of the random figurines I have up here. It's basically the equivalent of if I take this and move it slowly, he stays on. If I move it quickly, he goes sliding off. And what's going to happen is it might be easier to know V. That if you're driving in a car and you take a hard left turn, if you want your, and I have a figure that shows a little bit, but I'm talking about now. If you're moving in a car and make a hard left turn, you're moving in a circular path. You probably don't know the radius of this curvature. If you don't know the radius of this curvature, you probably don't know your angular velocity. It's not the angular velocity of the wheels. It would be the angular velocity of you making that left before making a full circle. But you would know your tangential velocity, how fast you're moving at that point. Do you understand what I mean? Sydney, does that make sense? Yeah, yep, okay. yep, that's good. And so sometimes it's easier to know V. And yeah, sometimes you'd be given one, sometimes you're given the other. With this ancient ass toy, I wonder how old this thing is. This is from when I was a kid. When I'm spinning this, you'd probably give the angular velocity because that's going to be easier to measure. But once again, we're going to do problems like a car driving over a hill, which we will get to on Wednesday. We won't have time today. We're going to do things like, well, a roller coaster doing a loop to loop. It'll sometimes be easier to know V. But anytime something's moving in a circular path, it doesn't need to be moving on a circle. Like this guy is one example. But this would be true any time something moves in a circle. So this would also be true. I'm going to get ahead of myself with videos I'm not supposed to do yet. It will also be that. That'll also be, just for that part, will be something moving in a circle. Not when it's going up and down, but just in the actual circular part. And so that is another spot that we'll have to say, OK, that's a circular path. It might be easier to measure V doing that. And so sometimes you have one, sometimes you're the other. You just use whichever one you need. Now, keep in mind that is centripetal acceleration. There's also tangential acceleration, which we already covered. 
that tangential acceleration is just all alpha. Tangential acceleration will always be tangential to the movement. Anytime someone asks for total acceleration, you just vector add the two. And they're always perpendicular to each other. So it's always just same idea for perpendicular. Okay. Now, if you have accelerations, you must have force. In this case, when I spin this guy, what keeps it on his path is tension, because there's a ribbon rope thing here. That's what keeps it on its path. And if I have acceleration, I must have a force. What that force is, how those forces work, that will be on Wednesday. I'm out of time. Also, an example problem on centripetal acceleration would be my next slide, where I'll cover Wednesday, because I don't have time to do it now. But the general idea is we're going to go back to Newton's laws and just add a new acceleration. But other than that, it's going to be Newton's laws, just like in chapter four, using the same logic. But yeah, as I said, we'll do that then. Uh, for now, we've really only got the kinematics. Um, any questions before I go? I'm a minute over now. Okay, so we'll stop there. Have a good day. See you Wednesday. Bye. Thank you.